Hi there everybody, welcome back to another video. We're going to be doing some box opening and review because uh, we've done an awful lot on the Garden Railway and that. So um, today a big parcel arrived. Oh it's like Christmas and birthday rolled into one. Um, and this is the locomotive that I've bought. We've got a Hornby, um, it's R3119 is the catalogue number. And this is a um, LMS 462 Princess Coronation class Duchess of Abercorn. Um, this particular class of locomotive were also referred to as Duchess class or even City class uh, based on the names. Um, and it's a locomotive that I remember from my childhood insofar as I had um, a second hand Hornby 00 Duchess of Athol in uh, pretty much the same livery as this even down to not having the smoke deflectors. Um, I also have the Duchess of Montrose and I had a City of London as well. Uh, in fact, I've still got them knocking about somewhere. Um, but we're going to see how this compares. This is the bang up to date Hornby version um, and uh, obviously not made from the same moulds. In fact, even to the point where I don't think it's even made from the same moulds that the model 10 years ago was made from. So hopefully this will be a bang up to date model that um, fits in well with the other really recent stuff that uh, I've got. Now I haven't really bought much in the way of Hornby locomotives. I think the last Hornby locomotive that I bought brand new uh, was the L1 um, in the uh, LNER Apple Green but with British Railways on the tanks and that was, gosh that was like two maybe even three years ago so it's not often that I buy Hornby locomotives but it kind of reached a point where I've got um, all of the really good Bankman stuff that I want so I'm starting to fill in the gaps with the Hornby stuff and I just really really fancied to relive some of those childhood memories with this particular model. Now ooh, let's see if we can get into this. Right, we've got, um, this is a bit of a blast from the past in a way. We've got the polystyrene inner and we've kind of become quite used to the uh, the plastic surrounds. Even um, Helgen have started using those. But we've got here typical um, Hornby uh, packaging. We've got the polystyrene and then they always have this sort of printed uh, picture of the train over the top. Um, so you kind of get to see the model in its finery. Unlike the actual Backman models where they let the model itself do the talking but you know it is quite nice um, and it also protects the model itself from rubbing against some of the packaging in transit. What's also fallen out is the usual mix of you know we've got the generic um, instructions on how to use a model railway locomotive. We also get this detailing pack and uh, it's quite interesting actually unlike some of the other models it actually in there I can see it gives you a guide to where these pieces actually go and I know on a lot of models there's been a lot of debate as to where the heck you actually put some of these pieces. There's not a lot of detailing um, in here we've got some brake rigging and the front and back vacuum pipes but uh, you know they're there for you to fit if you need to. And now we get down to the model and I'm going to open it up down here so we're going to tilt the camera down and we've got uh, spare coupling there for if you're using older style rolling stock. So it's a big fat coupling and also some front steps there. Um, that's pretty much if you're either going to put this locomotive on display or you have very, very generous curves because otherwise they're going to catch on the bogey. So I'm going to stick with the narrow uh, tension lock coupling uh, as a lot of people will do. Um, so for now, we're just going to ignore that. Now we can see here we've got the tissue paper wrapping and the locomotive in there. That is a beautiful locomotive. And the way to get this out is underneath on the back, just protect that, we've got two holes you can see there and there that we just push through with a finger to lift these items out. Don't try and pull them out by the, um, the detail themselves because you're liable to end up breaking something. So you can see there, push from behind with a finger wriggle it a bit from the front just to make sure it doesn't jam and we can lift that out. So we've got the tender there wrapped up in the tissue paper and let's get the front bit out as well so we can have them both together. Again using that hole at the back we're going to push out, give it a wriggle and uh, just try and lift that clear. Again trying not to grip onto any of the detail because it's going to be quite fragile and we don't want to break any of that so let's just uh, unwrap all this and you'll see there's some bits of polystyrene in there just to protect some various bits of detail so there's one in the cab 
um, to remember to take out. Uh, and also at the front it's also worth pointing out that uh, underneath that front bogey there we've got another one there just to stop that front bogey from flapping around in transit. So we make sure we take both of those out, have a quick look over, there's nothing else and uh, just get that out from the tissue paper. Now I've seen on a, an online review site uh, a lot of people going on about there was a photograph of this locomotive um, and uh, had wires trailing between the tender and the locomotive. Now what this actually was was that the person who'd photographed it for whatever reason hadn't plugged this little plug-in to the uh, appropriate socket on the tender. In the tender is the socket for if you want to put a DCC chip in or the DCC sound chip and speaker so that connection across there is really just to facilitate that and it means that you, to DCC chip this locomotive you do not have to go delving about inside this which can only really be a good thing because you're just lifting a simple body off and there's plenty of room in there to stick all that sort of stuff in and I can see at the bottom behind the centre wheel set there's actually quite a big hole there and I presume that the speaker sits in there facing down so any sound can be directed out through the hole. Now there doesn't appear to be any tender pickups um, which I know we did a review on the Q1 which does have tender tip pickups so there's just a simple pin there and you can see ooh, we're going to have to work I think some kind of cradle is probably the easiest but for now what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to lay out the piece of tissue paper. This is simply so we don't get nasty rubbing marks on things like the boiler and the chimney when we turn it over and make sure with this that we get it the right way round. Now it looks to be, yeah, it's very reminiscent of the uh, Mitsumi type connector that uh, the sound cables used to um, be connected on, on uh, old CD-ROMs. I mean that really is a blast from the past. They don't give you much slack on this wire I have to say. And I'm looking at this and trying to decide what the best way to do. I suspect that I've got to try and line that up first. Gosh this is fiddly. <laughs> and I suppose it's one of the things that in the normal run of things once it's on your layout and connected up you really don't need to mess about with it again. But if you're taking it in and out of the box, you will have to disconnect this. I'm just pushing that down. It feels in there, yeah. And once that's plugged in, gosh, yeah, there we are. Just got to make sure that uh, these wires don't catch on some of this detailing here, otherwise they'll pull on the socket and I can see there there's a bit of stress on those pins and it may not be a problem if you're running on DC but obviously if you're on DCC you've got to be very careful about that otherwise you will interrupt the uh, supply through to the chip. Anyway we've got that connected up so let's just roll this back over get that out of the way and we can see instantly we've got this sort of satin almost matte finish on the uh, the paintwork and it is a lovely finish it does not look toy like in any any way and we've got very fine handrails and separately applied name plates the, the detail on this is magnificent bear in mind my previous experiences with this type of locomotive is a Hornby 00 model that really dates back from at the very latest with the city of London the early 1960s but uh, what, one of the big put-offs with the earlier Hornby uh, Duchess Coronation class was the valve gear. It looked very, very toy-like and kind of uh, quite primitive. But on this model, no such problem. If we just roll that carefully onto its side so we can see there, we've got very, very fine valve gear, even down to the fluted rods and all of the uh, Valshart's motion. And that is superb. It's on a par with any of the uh, up-to-date modern uh, Backman locomotives. So 10 out of 10 for this. As you can see as well on the back we've got a fixed pickup truck and it's flangeless and this is quite a clever idea. What it means is this locomotive can go around much tighter train set type curves than the real one ever would 
um, without compromising the detail here because effectively that flanged wheel isn't going to pop off the track or derail the locomotive in the process and you get a much more scale look to this whole area of the model and it's a method that they've employed with the newer version of the A4 Pacifics as well so you know what we should see with that is that it'll make it quite a reliable runner. One of the sore points with Hornby steam locomotives I've had, and certainly this is something that put me off buying the more recent 72XX282 coal tanks, is that the uh, pony truck wheels can look a bit toy-like. They seem to have a very odd looking flange. And it's not too bad on this, um, this bogey. Um, it isn't really too obvious, I have to say. So again, it's a model that I'm quite happy with. One thing which does look a bit detracting is that the actual moulding, the, the, well, the casting for the front pony truck, it seems to be they're reusing an old casting. And um, it's difficult really to show, but you can just see there, if I turn it that way around, you can see where the old tension lock coupling screwed in and there's a space there for the, for the arm. It may be that you can actually screw on this large fat um, tension lock coupling on the front but really I don't really see why you'd want to because that'll make the front of your locomotive look butt ugly and these locomotives would pretty much always have been turned um, when they reached the end of the line to, to go back. They would not particularly have run tender first so um, we won't be sticking anything on there and indeed they haven't even give you, given you a thin streamlined tension lock coupling like the one that's on the back so um, it's not necessarily a problem but um, it does seem a little bit odd we've got sprung buffers on the front and they are nicely turned out in metal and again front buffer beam detail just blowing a, a little bit of uh, all it is is some of the polystyrene debris from the front there we do have down the center of the boiler that I can see the moulding line, well the release line, this is where obviously the mould has to be able to release the model um, after they've injection moulded it and sometimes you get a little line down where the two halves of the mould fit together and um, you can see it there and the nitpickers will probably, once you've seen that, you'll go oh well, that's terrible but in all honesty I've seen a lot worse um, and it doesn't bother me too much Yes, this was a fairly expensive locomotive and unfortunately a lot of the Hornby models are because you have to remember whereas Backman is the manufacturer, Hornby, they contract out to people like Cader who do the manufacture, well who are Backman in effect. So in effect they're being put over a little bit of a barrel at the moment which is very unfortunate because models like this are a very nice model but the price has gone up a lot faster than the Batman models because effectively they have much less control over the manufacturer but there's talk that Hornby will be shifting their manufacturing possibly to somewhere like India and um, if they have a greater control over the manufacturing it can only be a good thing because I think we'll all agree we do want to see Hornby survive as a company. We don't want to see a monopoly in the hands of another company like Backman. That's not to say that Backman is a bad company. It is totally not. But I think variety in the market, just like in any other market, is important. Uh, looking over the tender of this locomotive, the coal load, to some eyes, is a little bit coarse. But it doesn't have this huge mounded heat that we've seen in a lot of locomotives. And, you know, we can live with that. You could put a dusting of coal dust straight over the top. Um, and, you know, it's not a, not a detracting bad model. Overall, I'd give this model a good healthy 8.5 out of 10. There's a few aspects of it that hark back to the fact that this is not a brand new release um, to the market. But is in fact a model that was developed a little while ago. And, of course, technology has moved on. But nonetheless, this is an excellent model. And uh, it's a model which, given the fact that I grew up with the Duchess of Athol, Duchess of Montrose, it's something which I think a lot of other people might be in the same position. There's a bit of nostalgia going on there. So there we are. The Hornby R3119, Duchess of Abercorn. I hope you've liked this review and enjoyed it. Don't forget to share this video and uh, like it too. And subscribe to the channel and you'll be the first to know about new videos 
as we put them online. Anyway, take good care of yourself and uh, have fun playing with your model railway. <laughs> Bye for now.